James chapter 1, if you would turn there. Um, I, yeah, I am going to, I am going to finish uh, what I put together, um, was planning on preaching this morning, but I tell you what, I, I just about was going to let Tim have the service. I was thinking about that seriously. And he could have done it too and done a fine job. But let's read this and we'll go to prayer and we'll find out about the joy of religion. The joy of it. James 1, 22, be you do, but be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and and you underline this in your Bible, continue with therein. I don't know how many times, especially in the New Testament, where the New Testament writers will talk about faith and the grace of God, but will always add, if you continue, if thou hold fast that which thou hast from the beginning. Things like that. In other words, and Brother Tim and I were talking about this. We were talking about men of God that have fallen either into sin or deception, changed their opinions about Bibles, changed their opinions about things going on in the world, sodomy and things like that, and what, makes, what causes them to, to go wrong and to fail. And I said, to me, they, they just have rejected the clear and the plain word of God. They've decided in their mind that it's, it's not right. There's something in their heart that has moved them away. And I told him, I said, I, I study some of these men that have fallen, these pastors. And not for some vain thing, but so that I'm warned against turning out like them. I don't want to fall. I don't want to walk away. I don't want to have to be put out. I don't want anything like that. I want to continue until God is done with me here on this earth. And then I want to go home and be with Jesus. As long as he has work for me here, I'll do it. When he's ready to call me, I want to go. I don't want to be the preacher that everybody talks about that fell away. So, verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, I, we already read that, uh, go down to verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now notice he used the word religion here. And... You know, like I said, there was a time when, and it's still going on, people who are Christians or churches, when they talk to people, they don't want to use the R word. They want to try to hide what we're there for. If we talk to people on the street or we knock a door, um, or like Tim does, passing out tracts, and they ask, what it is, is this, is this some kind of religion? If we say no to them, are we being honest? No, we're trying to deceive them because the word religion has so many bad things attached to it that people don't want it. They, they don't want it because they don't understand it. But this is a religion and there are bad religions and there is a good religion. One good religion. I do not believe that all faiths lead to the same God. Except for the fact that all false faiths do lead to the same little g, God. And that's Satan. Somebody say amen. I don't want to be a part of that. This man's religion is, is in vain. So he's contrasting a man who looks religious, dresses religious, wears a tie and a suit, 
Man has short hair, clean cut, hair combed proper, if he's got any. Looking religious or these men that wear robes because they're the clergy and that separates them from the rest of the people. So they wear religious garb on themselves. They look religious. But what comes out of their tongue determines the religion that they are really a part of. They may wear a cross, but if they go against the word of God, they, their religion is in vain. So then he says, here's what the pure religion is. It is undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Let's, let's pray. Um, I talked to Brother Roy. He's not in the hospital. Um, he hit his hand last night uh, when he got up and uh, said it hit the wall or something like that. He thought it might be broken. It was hurting real bad. They, he went to the ER, they x-rayed it, and said that it's probably arthritis. It doesn't look like anything's broken, uh, but he is in a lot of pain over it. So pray for him. Uh, I mentioned uh, Al Hemphill, Roy's nephew, good man, I love him. Uh, his mother passed away. I told him that our church loves him and that we're praying for him. And you just remember to pray for those who have needs. Pray for Michael and Kenya and the work that's going on out there. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, God, and we thank you for allowing us to be in your house, to worship you, to sing your, to sing your songs, to praise your name, to thank you, God, for everything you've done for us. Father, we are rotten people. There's no good thing in us, and yet you love us and have put your love in us and saved us by your grace. And Father, help us to enjoy our religion. This is not a burden that we carry. It is a joy to believe in you. And though our flesh may suffer, our heart rejoices of the salvation and the mercy that you have given us. Bless us tonight, Father. Bless your word. Give me clarity of thought. Give these people wisdom, great wisdom, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Now, when I was thinking about this, and, and James talking about what pure religion is, and he's saying it like James was the half-brother of Jesus. I don't know what half, the right half or the left half, but he was the half-brother of Jesus. And he was one among several family members, one of the few, I believe, that believed that Jesus was who he said he was. We have the, uh, the statement in the Gospels, that his brethren, the, the sons of Mary, did not believe him. They did not trust him as the Messiah. They didn't believe the story. I like the joke Tim told this morning. Why can't you be like your brother Jesus? Okay? How do, how do you keep up with that? Amen? But James here is talking about the goodness of religion. How many evil things have been done in this world over 6,000 years of history that have been done in the name of religion? Adolf Hitler was deeply involved in occult religion. Um, Heinrich Himmler, one of his right-hand men, was holding seances, doing rituals in a, in a castle to the black sun, something that they believed a power and energy source that is underneath the earth that would give the German people great power to conquer the world. They were summoning hell to be on their side. They did it in the name of religion. The Crusades of the Catholic Church. Might I also say, and I haven't, I haven't read a whole lot about the Salem witch trials, but I do believe that these zealous Christians made mistakes in persecuting people who probably didn't do anything wrong. I believe in some cases they were following superstition and not following the word of God. But how many evil things have been done in the name of religion? And it's given in a bad name. But James here is saying there is a pure religion. 
a religion that we don't have to be ashamed of when we talk about it. A religion that gives to people and helps people and tries to remain unspotted from the things of this world. Turn to Romans chapter 1. JR, can you turn on that AC over there? Is everybody a little warm? It's because I'm hot air. Romans 1, verse 16. Listen to Paul. First epistle that we have in our Bibles. And he starts right out. Wham! For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Everywhere Paul went, he went deliberately to deliver the good news to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles that they can be saved from their sins, that God can forgive them, that they can spend eternity in heaven and they can have Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord and Savior. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is not, this is not a white man's religion. It doesn't belong to the Caucasians, the Anglo-Saxons. It is a religion according to Matthew 28, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. Acts chapter 1, where Jesus commissioned the disciples to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. And Revelation chapter 7, where we have a great multitude surrounding the throne of Jesus Christ and they're from every people, nation, language, and tongue. They are from all over the world, red, yellow, black, white, doesn't matter who they are, where they came from, how low they were birthed, how high they were birthed. They were all the same in God's eyes, and he died for every single one of them. Somebody say amen. Boy, that's good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. God is no respecter of persons when it comes to the gospel. Any man can be saved, no matter what his religion. In fact, if this is true, and there are over 4,000 religions, we have a lot of work to do. If we're going to try to convince the world, and I know the world, the whole world's not going to be saved, but if we're going to try to convince people that the gospel is the true way, we've got a lot of work to do. And maybe you don't understand somebody else's religion. I would say maybe you don't have to. I would say understand yours well enough to tell it to somebody else. The best way to do that is how. Read the Bible. Give them scripture verses because our words don't change people. God's words do. Amen. For therein, verse 17, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now this is a legal term. If you have been accused of a crime and you are tried in a court and the evidence does not prove your guilt, you are declared not guilty and are now justified in the court of law and are free from any condemnation. That is a legal term that he's using here. The just... The people who have been found not guilty shall live by faith, but not by works. For the wrath of God, now he's turning, we have the joy of religion, and we have the warning against false religions. The wrath of God... Uh, let me, let me look at verse 17 again. I just saw this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So God reveals how we can be righteous. Sister Pam and I were talking before the service, and she corrected me on something, and I appreciated it. I, I had mentioned here, I guess a week ago, something like that about this Lutheran girl that I went to high school with and how she had to 
learned the catechism, and I said, after she says all the right words, she gets baptized and is a member of the church, and she's told she's going to heaven. And Sister Pam said, technically, if her family's been Lutheran her whole life, she was baptized as a child. What does that do? Nothing. And I've read Lutheran comments on how they justify that, but to the baby, it means absolutely nothing. Pam, were you baptized as a baby? Not. Oh, you were a Methodist. Okay. You were sprinkled. Anyway. Anyway, here's God revealing righteousness. And now, verse 18, God's revealing his wrath. You see the, con you see the, con the, the connection here? Here's righteousness. Here's how you receive it. You receive it by faith. Now I'm going to reveal my wrath to you. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They were told by somebody. John 3, 16. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They were told these things. They had the truth. They chose not to abide by it. They chose not to agree to it. They wanted it not in their lives. They loved their sin more than they loved God and his righteousness. So now God has to deal with this. Because that, so uh, the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Brother Tim was right this morning in talking about how science has had to keep up with the Bible being right all this time. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, and consider her. Nobody knew at the time that the ruler of the ant colony was a female. They didn't know because you can't pick them up and look at them like you can puppy dogs, right? You're looking at the paws of their feet. That's how you tell. I heard a dad say that to his little kids. Daddy, what are you doing? So you can tell by the paws of their feet whether they're male or female. <laughs> he didn't want to get into it. I thought that was cute. Anyway, how many things now do we know about this world and this universe that God has already declared. The water cycle. Solomon wrote about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. All the rivers run in the sea, yet the sea is not full. They return back to the place they came from. He was describing, and you cannot see water rising up from the ocean and going up into the clouds. You cannot physically see that. How did they know it? How did Solomon know it? God told it to him, and he had that wisdom, and he wrote it down. The verse, the verse in the Bible about DNA. For in thy book all my members are written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. He is describing the perfect way DNA works in, in conceiving a human child or any living creature. He's describing the exact way when at that time they knew nothing of the science of it. They just knew the actions of it. They knew nothing of how it worked. It was a mystery to them. And yet David is writing it down by inspiration from God. And all of these things in the Bible, learning to wash your hands uh, and, and clean yourself and so on, all of these things came to civilization from God teaching us how to live. He showed it to them and showed it to them by the creation. He said in verse 19, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And I have said this before, that I don't quite understand it, but I be have to believe, according to this, that somehow, some way, everybody in their soul knows who God is. I have to believe that. But at some point, they choose to worship idols. They choose the foolishness of idolatry and works-based blessings instead of grace through faith. 
Brother Tim quoted from the Book of Mormon. I think it was 2 Nephi. For by grace are you saved after all that you have done. Once you become your very best, then God will choose to save you. He'll forgive whatever sins you cannot conquer. That is not what the Bible says. It's a contradiction. Now, he mentioned the true religion being a blessing to children and to widows. This brings to mind the two commandments that I mentioned this morning. Mark 12, 29, Jesus answered him, First of all, the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Does anybody know where that comes from? I'll give you a dollar if you can tell me where that comes from in the Bible. Let me read it again. The Lord our God is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Deuteronomy, keep going. See if I got a dollar. Can you break a 20? <laughs> Deuteronomy 6. Yeah, you were going to say that. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, and he, then he gives the second one. $10, $5. $5 if you can tell me where the second commandment comes from. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. $5. I probably shouldn't be doing this. I've been watching The Price is Right. <laughs> Come on down. That's about the only thing decent and clean that we can watch. Huh? No. It's in the law. It's in the law. And I was, I tell you what, I was blessed when I found it. Leviticus. You were only one book off. Turn to Leviticus 19.11. I want you to read this. This is glorious. This is God giving basic instructions. For people on how how to love your neighbor verse 11 you shall not steal neither deal falsely neither lie one to another don't steal from your neighbor don't put up a fence on his property and claim it is yours because after 10 years that's legal true if you put up a fence and it falls on your neighbor's property and it goes uncontested after 10 years, that is your legal property. Learned that from Judge Judy because she said she lived in a, a gated neighborhood, obviously, and her neighbor asked her if he could put up a fence between his property and her property. She said, only if you sign this waiver saying that you will never try to claim the property that that fence is on. And he said, no, I'm not signing that. And she said, you're not putting up a fence. It is the law. And some people would do it to steal another man's property. People are that way. You should not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie to one another. Verse 12, you shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Listen, your neighbors will hear you cursing, won't they? They'll hear you swearing. They'll, God will make sure they hear you say God and Jesus Christ in a vain, slanderous way. God said, don't do it. Don't you drag my name through the mud. Verse 13, thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. In other words, if you owe the guy money for mowing your grass, you pay him. Pay the man when he's done. If he's going to be there doing plumbing work in your house, and he writes you up a bill, you pay him. 
you pay them. You don't, don't you dare steal that from somebody. And then, then invite him to church. Believe it or not, people have the gall to do that. They will rob and steal. They'll go to people and say, what, well, this is for our church. Can't you give us a, like a church discount? And here's this man trying to earn a living for his family by running a family-owned business. And you're, you're bringing God into a business deal, making him feel guilty about dealing with you, forcing him to give a discount or have a bad name with God. God said, don't do it. Verse 14, thou shalt not curse the deaf. Amen? They can't hear you do it. Don't make fun of them. Don't make fun of how they talk. Don't curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind. Thou shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. Even though they can't see, God can. God can see. Verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. But thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. If you've got a neighbor on this side who's wealthy, who has a name in the community, he's got a little power with the county, he can get things done, and you, you know, sli slide up to him and try to be his friend and, and try to get in good with him. But these people down the road here, they don't make very much money. They don't, they don't have a clean house. You don't like their kids. And you treat them like trash. God said you don't do that. Out of the two, who do you think is more likely to receive the gospel? The poor. The person who thinks he can get his way through life by making underhanded deals and things like that, they will never accept the gospel because they can't buy it. They want to buy it so they can own it and it be theirs. Uh, verse 16, thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Look at how he says this. He's, he's telling you how to deal with your neighbor, and he says, I am the Lord. And that word means something. That means he is our king, our prince. If he says jump, we jump. If he says go, we go. We do not disobey the commandment of a Lord. There's consequences. Don't be a talebearer among the people. Don't be the gossip lady. Always looking in on everybody's business, trying to get in everybody's stuff, looking at what's on their phone, trying to, trying to look over their, peer over their, their shoulder and read their text messages and, and, and get into their emails and, and look at their browsing record and try to find out where they spent last night and who, who they're going out with and all this stuff. Yes, there are people like that. There are people like that everywhere and there are people like that in churches. God said, don't do it. He said, verse 17, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. I like how he said that. You can be nice to people to face, shake their hand, tell them you love them, and hate their guts. I've had that done. Mm. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. There are people that you're going to have to learn how to forgive. And I will be honest with you, I'm struggling with that. Struggling. Asking God to lift that off of me. Thou should not in, in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Don't wish him to go to hell. Don't tell him to go to hell. Amen? You don't tell your neighbor to go to hell. 
Don't rebuke thy neighbor. Keep your dogs on your property. I'm sick and tired of seeing your dogs. You know what you do? Let God handle it. Let God handle it. God will kill the dogs. Okay? God can kill the dogs. They get run over. Okay? Don't do that to your neighbor. Don't rebuke your neighbor. Don't get into a fight with your neighbor. Don't do that. We got a situation right now. There's a man that lives behind us here, and he owns the wooded area behind the church. We got a situation where, Joe, we're going to have to cut down some trees back here because I got out one day, and they were rubbing each other like this, and the wind's blowing, and they're half dead, and they're leaning over our playground area in our church in the back of the building. Now, I don't know exactly where the property line is, but I make, I make an assumption that it ends where that little ditch is. And the trees are on the other side of that. Well, I got the guy's number. Because he, every now and then, he'll text me. If he sees something funny going on over here, he'll send me a text message and tell me about it. He watches out for this place. I like him. So I contacted him and I said, I'd like to talk to you about some trees I think it's on your side. We need, probably need to cut them down because they're leaning over our... And he said, well, I do that for a living. I'll take a look at it. And he just happened to be here when Lisa and I pulled in. And I talked to him at length. And he said that he's, he's really not comfortable with climbing them because one, one of them is partly dead. He said, you probably need a bucket, uh, a boom to do that. But anyway, he said, you know what he said? He said, thank you for asking me. I said, you're our neighbor. I wouldn't do that to a man's property. That's your property. You own that tree. You have a right to it. I don't. And I wouldn't assume that I did have a right to it simply because it might be a danger to our property. You do what's right. And the man was very courteous. He's always been courteous. He's a young guy. And I don't know if he's lost or saved, but I'm never going to get into it with our neighbors ever again. I've had that happen before and God chastened the fire out of me over that and I had to repent and I'm glad I did. And I told him, I said, hey, you're our neighbors. We want to be good to our neighbors. There's people in this area that we know have sold drugs out of a house in this area somewhere. We didn't like it but we didn't rebuke our neighbor. Let God have it. You know what God did? God sent us a bunch of drug addicts to witness to and give Bibles to. That's what God did. Oh, verse 18. Now look at it. Here it is. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Now you know the context of it, don't you? Now, you can, listen to me, you cannot now make up any excuse why you hate your neighbor. Because it looks to me like God has covered pretty much all the ground here on how to deal and who is our neighbor. Everybody. Everybody is our neighbor. Everybody you meet, everybody you deal with, everybody you do business with, everybody you talk to, everybody in your family, everybody that lives in your subdivision, everybody that lives in your trailer court, everybody that lives in your RV park, everybody that lives in your apartment complex, your nursing home, everybody is your neighbor. And God has told you in no uncertain terms how he expects you. By, by him saying, I am the Lord, these are not just suggestions. These are commandments. And oh, how often we sin against our neighbor when we don't love them the way we love ourselves. Amen to that? That's good context. I'm glad I found that. I wished I could have given somebody $5 for it. Now, 
We got 10 minutes. Here's unspotted. This is the second part. The first part is to visit the, the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So here's, here's the context that God is doing this in. That word spot. Type that in your Bible search deal and run through the scriptures. You're going to get a wealth of information. This is not the first place it's mentioned. The first place spots are mentioned is when, uh, who is it? Jacob is taking all the ring straked and spotted cattle. And he's, he's mating them in such a way as that all of the cattle that are born are ring straked and spotted. He's just, that was the deal that he worked out with, who was it, Laban? That was a deal that he worked out, and that was the agreement. And it's, watch this, it's easy to tell whose cattle belongs to who, isn't it? If that goat comes out and it's all white or all brown, that belongs to his father-in-law. If it comes out and it's got streaks and spots on it, that's mine. And they got into it. Remember, they got into it over this deal. And Jacob said, take a look at my cattle. And if you see any of them that are not ring straked and spotted, I forgot what he said, but he basically said, I guarantee you they're not there. He said, I didn't steal a thing from you. You know what happened? God blessed Jacob. Made him wealthy. Cattle was money back then. Cattle was money in the bank. Then we go to Leviticus and we start dealing with leprosy. Leprosy is a picture of sin. Because of this, leprosy, number one, is a destruction of the flesh. It kills the cells. Number two, it spreads. It doesn't stop. If you've got leprosy on your hand, back then, what was the best way to deal with it? Cut your hand off. What did Jesus say? If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. Because, why? It's better... For you to go through life without that hand, then it is for that hand, the infection, to take over the entire body and destroy it. That is exactly how sin works. And what is leprosy? Does anybody know how you get it? What is it? Is it a poison from a plant? Like poison ivy? It's bacteria is what I'm getting at. Bacteria, I think. A germ. Can you see a germ? And we have one little sin that nobody knows about and we think we can keep it hidden. But what happens? Germs take over. And the whole purpose of you having to walk through town saying unclean, unclean, unclean is so that you did not pass on that germ to anybody else. You think God knew how to deal with it? Amen? When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be, he mentioned the word spot specifically because God wants you to associate that spot with sin then he shall be brought into Aaron the priest or unto one of his sons the priest and you skip on down to verse 8 it goes into detail about how the priest should look at it and at verse 8 if the priest see that behold the scab spreadeth in the skin then the priest shall pronounce him unclean it is a leprosy 
And to anybody who had it, it was a nightmare. However, remember what leprosy represents in the Bible. What does it represent? I got a wheel missing, I think. Sin. I was reading in the days of Elisha the prophet. Who was it that they encompassed the city of Samaria? They surrounded it and there was a famine and they cut everybody inside the city off from food and everything. And they were selling dove's dung to eat. Remember that story? And the prophet told the king's right-hand man, he said, tomorrow you'll be selling fine flour and barley for a shekel. You'll be selling it. I'm paraphrasing that, but that's what he said. And the man next to the king said, I don't believe that. And he said, I'm telling you, it's going to happen, but you're not going to see it. There were four lepers at the gate of the city. How many? They were named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were spotted with leprosy. But God used them. They said, why we sit here and die at the gate? Why don't we go to the enemies over here where they got food and put ourselves in their hands? If they kill us, we're going to die anyway. What's the big deal? We're dying now. I'd rather go and be stabbed and die than sit here and die. Let's take a chance and go over there and see if they'll give us any food. Well, they got over there and the whole camp was empty. All the tents were up. All the cattle were there. All the horses and camels were there. All their gold, their uniforms, and their food was in their tents. And the men went in, sat in a tent, and they just started eating. And they grabbed up big bundles of it, and they took off with it and hid it. And then they went to another tent and did the same thing. Stole everything out of it and went and hid it. And now they got full bellies. And they go back the floor, go back into the city, and spread the good news. There's salvation. There's food out there. And the king said, oh, I don't believe that. His right-hand man said, I don't believe that. They said, well, send somebody out there. They sent people out there, and they come back and said it's true. And the king's right-hand man, the king told him, you monitor the gate to let people out. And he went over there, and they trampled him to death. Just like God said. But four lepers saved an entire city. Can God use you? Can God use sinners? Absolutely. But God's got to clean you. You need clean. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, listen up, husbands. All you husbands here, all you husbands online, listen up. Love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Unconditional love for your wife. Constant love. Forgiveness love. Caring charity love for your wife. Because after all, God made her to look up to you. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without what? Blemish. Now you have a word associated with it. So now you're going to study the word spot, spots, spotted, and blemish. Blemished, blemishes, blemishingly. <laughs> I don't think that's in there. Study these words. Learn what, learn what God is saying. You, God, Jesus has to wash you with clean water. And if the water you're in is not clean, what good does it do to bathe in it? Amen? By the way, it's better off take a shower. 
Why would you want to lay in a still, tepid bowl of water in your own filth? I don't understand that. 1 Timothy 6, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. He's talking to us preachers. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's the man of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot. Unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep yourself without spot. Again, it's not easy to do. 2 Peter 2, verse 10. When it comes to false teachers, false doctrine, false preachers, uh, for time's sake, I'm going to read verse 13. They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to write in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes. See how it puts them together? Spots and blemishes. That's the Bible way of telling you that both words mean the same thing. Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. And we have, we have pulpits Full of people like this. Full of spots and blemishes. Second Peter chapter 3, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in him, of him in peace, without spot. And now what word does he add to it? Blameless. Can they accuse you of something and be right? Jude, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I'm not going to be vain or vulgar in this, but God used... The illustration, I believe in Isaiah, of casting away Israel because of their sins, casting them away as a menstruous cloth, is what he said. You know what that is? That is a garment spotted by the flesh. Because that blood is a blood of cleansing. It cleanses the secret place of the woman. It washes it clean and makes it whole. And that sin then is cast out of the body. Do you see that? I'm trying to be PG here. But that's what God said. That's, a, that's, what, I, that's what came to mind when I read this. The garment spotted by the flesh and God cast them away. The works of righteousness are as filthy rags in God's sight. So, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Somebody say amen. Now quit because you said amen. And again, I know this is hard. Confess your sins. Confess them again. I've got years of confessing and 
however many more years I stay on this earth, I will spend that time confessing to God. For, the, for one reason, not because I think that I'm commanded to and God's going to beat me to death if I don't. I do it because I love my God more than I love me. And I remain in a state of sorrow in my soul for the sins of my youth. I hate them. And I ask God, I wouldn't say every day, I'm not that perfect, but oftentimes, God, forgive me. God, have mercy on me. That's pure religion and undefiled. Father, bless your word. Thank you for it. Reveal to us, Father, through the word, things that I can never say things, God, that only you can teach them. It is you who can open up the word, not me. So, Father, bless your people tonight with the good word of faith, how to be unspotted from this world, how to treat our neighbors, how to deal with them. Forgive us, O oh God, of the sins of our past and of our youth. We commend ourselves into your hand. We ask you, God, to keep that which we've committed unto you against the day of your coming. Bless the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people says, Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.